What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with James Rasband was given on October 23, 2012. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our devotional today. We will have the opportunity of hearing from Brother James R. Rasband, Dean of the J. Reuben Clark Law School. We especially welcome his wife, Mary, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us today, as well as other distinguished guests. James R. Rasband is the Dean and UW Colton Professor of Law at the J. Reuben Clark Law School. He received his undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Following law school, he clerked for Judge J. Clifford Wallace of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and then practiced law in Seattle, Washington, where his practice focused on Indian treaty litigation. He joined the law school faculty in 1995 and has been serving as dean of the law school since 2009. Dean Rasband's research and teaching is centered on public land law, and on natural resources law and policy. He has published many articles and book chapters on these subjects. He and his wife, Mary Williams Rasband, who teaches part-time in BYU's chemical engineering department, are the parents of four children. I would also add that Brother Rasband is a state president here on campus for our students. And now we'll have the privilege of hearing from Brother Jim Rasband. I must say I never imagined myself at this podium. But I have imagined myself on this playing floor, and imagined is the right word. I've wondered what it would have been like um, to be Danny Ainge, who during my freshman year at BYU went coast to coast in the closing seconds of a Sweet 16 game against Notre Dame and scored over Orlando Woolridge. I've dreamed what it might be like to drain a three from just inside half court like Jimmer Fredette did against Utah. Unfortunately, my actual skill set um, wasn't a match for such imagined heroics. I'm quite sure it's not a match for this podium either. Still, I consider it a great honor to have this opportunity to speak to you this morning. I love this university. I love the cool, crisp air of a late fall football game and the soft golden light that falls on Y Mountain and Rock Canyon just before sunset. I even love wandering the stacks at the Harold B. Lee Library. Now, I could go on, but let me just say, that BYU has had a great impact on my life. My first experiences at BYU were in the late 1960s. Each summer, my mother, my brother, and I came to BYU from our home in Pebble Beach, California for spring or summer term so that my mom could work on completing her degree. We lived in heritage halls, or to be more precise, we lived in what is now called classic heritage when it was almost new heritage. My mother ended up completing her English degree, and our home was forever enriched by what she learned at BYU. I mention her education at BYU partly because important parts of my thinking on today's topic are derived from my mother's thinking and writing on this topic. The title of my remarks is Faith to Forgive Grievous Harms, Accepting the Atonement as Restitution. Now to some, any talk from a lawyer that focuses on forgiveness may seem odd. Don't lawyers depend upon a lack of forgiveness to function? In lawyer speak is a talk on the necessity of forgiveness and admission against interest. Now, I'm convinced that practicing law with civility and integrity is a noble endeavor and fully compatible with a forgiving heart. And I'll say a bit more about that later. Indeed, before you become too critical of lawyers, listen to the words of my good friend Jim Gordon, who sits on the stand near me today. Quote, it is true that some lawyers are dishonest, arrogant, greedy, venal, amoral, ruthless, ruthless buckets of toxic slime. <laughs> On the other hand, it's unfair to judge the entire profession by a few hundred thousand bad apples. <laughs> um, such quips um, can be tough for those of us who are attorneys. But how much worse can it get, given the number of us whose parents, when we decided to go to law school, made sure to scrape off their car the Ask Me About My Children bumper sticker? 
Okay, on to the concept of forgiveness. Let me start with a familiar scripture, Matthew 18, 21 and 22 reads, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Have you or a family member or a friend ever been terribly hurt by someone and found it difficult to forgive, even once? let alone until 70 times 7. In such cases, do we say to ourselves, the Lord can't really mean that I should forgive that sort of sin or abuse. Yet it seems clear that the Lord really does mean it. Our very salvation depends upon us being willing to forgive others. As Christ taught, quote, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses." Close quote. That our own forgiveness should be conditioned on forgiving others can be a hard doctrine, particularly if the sin against us was horribly wrong and out of all proportion to any harm we've ever committed. Even harder, the Lord has indicated in modern revelation that, quote, he that forgiveth not his brother his, his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the greater sin, close quote. This is a very strong statement. If we refuse to forgive, there remaineth in us the greater sin. How can this be? As I hope to explain, our salvation is conditioned on forgiving others because when we refuse to forgive, what we're really saying is that we don't quite trust the Lord or that we reject his atonement. And it is our acceptance of the atonement that ultimately saves us. Why is it that we sometimes have trouble accepting the atonement as recompense for the harms we suffer at others' hands? My experience is that we can sometimes forget that the atonement has two sides. Usually when we think about the atonement, we focus on how mercy can satisfy the demands that justice would impose upon us. We are typically quicker to accept the idea that when we sin and make mistakes, the atonement is available to pay our debts. Forgiveness requires us to consider the other side of the atonement, a side that we don't think about as often, but that is equally critical. That is the atonement's power to satisfy our demands of justice against others, to fulfill our rights to restitution and being made whole. We often don't quite see how the atonement satisfies our own demands, but it does so. It heals us not only for the guilt we suffer when we sin, but it also heals us from the sins and hurts of others. To help explain the two sides of the atonement, let me try a rather homely analogy. Like most analogies and metaphors, it's not perfect in all respects. I hope, though, that it can aid understanding. Suppose I find myself in a home built for me by a very generous landlord. It is a nice home. He encourages me to maintain and improve the home and gives me a number of instructions for making the home a nice place to live. Over the years, I sometimes improve the home, but other times, through my negligence, I make it worse. One time, I flood the home when I fail to set the faucets to drip during a freeze. Another time, my kitchen catches fire because I fail to turn off a burner on the stove. A couple of times, I lose my temper and put my fist through a wall. In each instance, the landlord forgives me and encourages me to pay a little closer attention to my home and to his instructions for making the home a joyful place to live. He does not charge me for the damage caused by my mistakes. Instead, sometimes he's patient while I figure out how to fix things on my own. Sometimes he sends someone over to fix the problem. And sometimes I wake up and things are fixed in ways I don't quite understand. This same landlord happens to have a son who is quite wayward. The son is always up to no good and I don't particularly like or respect him. One night, the landlord's son is a prank, sets fire to the shed attached to the back of my house. The fire gets out of control and the entire house burns down. I lose the home. I lose all of my possessions, including some particularly valuable possessions that I can't replace, such as photos and heirlooms. I'm angry and distraught. I want the no good son to pay. I want him to fix things and to make me whole. A part of me knows, though, that he can't really make it better. He may not have the resources to rebuild the house, and even if he could rebuild the house, he can't retrieve the photos and heirlooms. 
and that makes me even angrier. As I sit in anger, the landlord comes to visit me. He reminds me that he has promised to take care of me. He promises me that he's willing to rebuild my house. In fact, he says he'll do more than that. He will replace my house with a castle and then give me all that he himself has. He says that this might take a while, but he promises that it will happen. What's the catch, I say? Here are the conditions, he says. First, you need to put your faith in me and trust that I really will build you that castle and restore all that you've lost. Second, you need to continue to work on implementing the instructions I gave you about keeping up your house. Finally, you need to forgive my arsonist son, just as I've forgiven you all these many years. Now, it sounds easy enough, and it seems like an obviously great deal, but why might it be hard for the tenant to accept the landlord's offer? Or to move away from the analogy, why is it sometimes so hard for us to forgive others? Let me suggest some reasons. First, we're probably angry. We want the arsonist to pay. But if we harbor this sort of anger, we may spend so much time pursuing the person who burned down our house that we don't get around to rebuilding it. As someone once said, resentment is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. It also might be hard to forgive because we can't quite believe the landlord will fulfill his promise. He's never failed us when we've messed up before. But what about this time? Besides, it's usually easier for us to believe that the Lord will forgive our mistakes. This time, it's someone else's mistake or sin. Trust can be particularly difficult if the rebuilding project will take time. We want things fixed now, not later. Trust may also be harder in the cases of losses and hurts that do not seem easily fixable. Perhaps the landlord can rebuild the home, but can he really replace the photos and heirlooms? What if we lost a child in the fire? Can he really take away that pain? My testimony is that the atonement really can make us completely whole, even for those things that seem like they can't be fixed or repaired. As Isaiah foretold of the Savior, quote, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to comfort all that mourn, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning." Close quote. Now I recognize that this doctrine, that the atonement can heal us from the hurts of others, is one that's well established. Yet in my experience, it remains difficult to trust and accept that the atonement serves this purpose. My hope is that I can add to what's previously been said on this topic and help remove some barriers to forgiveness by offering some reasons why we should trust the Lord's promise. I turn first to the Mosaic Law and to an insight I owe to my mother. Remember that Paul taught that the Mosaic Law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Remember also Christ's statement to his disciples in his Sermon on the Mount. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled." Close quote. Think about Christ's statement for a minute. Christ was comforting his faithful disciples, those who loved and revered and followed the law of Moses. He was making sure they knew that his plan was to fulfill all the terms of the Mosaic Law. But what exactly were those terms that he would fulfill? Our answer to this question typically focuses on the portion of the Mosaic Law that addressed Israel's obligation to make sacrifices. We tend to emphasize the Savior's admonition that, quote, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, and that instead we should, quote, offer for a sacrifice a broken heart and a contrite spirit, close quote. Our usual focus on the law of sacrifice is again on ourselves. What sacrifices we need to offer up to access the, the power of the atonement and heal our feelings of guilt and remorse. But the law of sacrifice was just one component of the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law also included dietary laws and criminal laws. Remember the lex talionis of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a, for a tooth. It also included civil laws that today we might recognize as tort law or contract law. Isn't it plausible that when the Savior said he came to fulfill the law, he was talking about more than just the law of sacrifice? Shouldn't we take him at his word 
that one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, although I'm not an expert on the Mosaic law and surely do not understand exactly how Christ fulfilled the law in all of its dimensions, let me suggest that the atonement did in fact answer other demands of the Mosaic law. Specifically, I want to focus on the civil law component of the Mosaic law and its requirement that restitution be made to persons harmed by the wrongful actions of another. I do so because the restitution requirement is so important to understanding the doctrine of forgiveness. Exodus 21 and 22 set forth several such restitution requirements. Consider two of many examples. If a person caused a fire to break out so that, the stand, so that quote, the standing corn or the field be consumed therewith, um, he that kindled the fire was required to make restitution, close quote. Similarly, if someone caused his livestock to graze in the field or vineyard of another, he was obligated to, quote, make restitution out of the best of his own field and of the best of his own vineyard, close quote. This concept of restitution remains a key part of our law today. Under tort law, which is just another word for personal injury law, courts can award damages to persons injured by the negligence of another. Similarly, under contract law, damages may be awarded to those harmed by breach of contract. In the criminal context, many states allow crime victims and their families to prepare what are called victim impact statements, which describe the way in which they've been harmed. The basic point is that just like current law, the Mosaic law was not designed only to punish the wrongdoer. The Mosaic law also existed to protect compensate and make whole those harmed by others, whether intentionally or negligently. If Christ came to fulfill all the terms of the law, this part of the Mosaic law should also be fulfilled by the atonement. So if the Mosaic law schools us that Christ intended to make full restitution for the harms we suffered, it still doesn't indicate how that could happen. Just like it's difficult to understand exactly how the atonement satisfies the demands of justice for our sins, it is challenging to grasp how the atonement works to make restitutions to us for the sins of others. As is the case with most such how questions in the gospel, we must ultimately fall back on our faith and trust the Lord that his promises are true, even if the mechanism is uncertain. But as an aid to our faith, let me suggest a couple of ways in which the atonement can be understood as making restitution. First, even for something as horrible as losing a child because of another's sin, the atonement ensures significant restitution through the resurrection. We are promised that in Alma that, quote, everything shall be restored to its perfect frame, close quote. In addition, just like the wealthy landlord in my analogy promised not only that he would build the tenant a castle, but also give the tenant all that he had. In scripture after scripture, the Lord promises us all that he has. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 107. And then shall the angels be crowned with the glory of his might, and the saints filled with his glory, and receive their inheritance, and be made equal to him." Close quote. Doctrine and Covenants section 84. He that receiveth me, receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father, receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my Father hath shall be given unto him." Close quote. If we can inherit all that the Father has, and if all will be restored to its perfect frame, is there a reason we should insist that the person who hurt us pay us back? Hasn't justice been satisfied? Now, it's critical to understand that forgiving others is not just a practical virtue. It's a profound act of faith in the atonement and the promise that the Savior's sacrifice repays not just our debts to others, but also the debts of others to us. In our live and let live society, we may believe that forgiving is just etiquette and good manners. It is not. We may think that forgiveness requires us to let mercy rob justice. It does not. Forgiveness does not require us to give up our right to restitution. It simply requires that we look to a different source. The non-judgmental worldly phrases, don't worry about it and no big deal, are not illustrations of the doctrine of forgiveness. On the contrary, when a person sins against us, it can be a very big deal. The point is that the atonement is very big compensation that can take care 
of very big harms. Forgiveness doesn't mean minimizing the sin. It means maximizing our faith in the atonement. My greatest concern is that if we wrongly believe forgiveness requires us to minimize the harms we suffer, this mistaken belief will be a barrier to developing a forgiving heart. It is okay to recognize how grave a sin is and to demand our right to justice if our recognition triggers gratitude for the atonement. Indeed, the greater the sin against us, the greater the harm that we suffer, the more we should value the atonement. Consider Christ's parable of the two debtors from Luke chapter 7. Quote, and there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, Christ, said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Close quote. If Simon is correct that the greater sinner will love the Lord even more, doesn't the same reasoning suggest that our love for the Savior will increase when he pays a particularly large debt owed to us? There is little value in claiming that a wrong against us is slight. Instead, if we give the wrong its full weight, we are better able to give the Lord a full measure of our gratitude for making us whole. And when we understand that the Lord promises us restitution, we can recognize that our anger at our victimizer is ultimately unnecessary. This, in turn, helps free us to love our enemy as the Savior commanded. In sum, the principle of forgiveness does not require that we give up our right to justice or that we give up our right to restitution. Christ answers the demands of the law for our sins and for the sins of others. We just have to be willing to accept that he has the power to do so. Now let me return briefly to a subject I raised at the beginning of my remarks. Specifically, some may still be wondering whether focusing on the commandment of forgiveness is an admission against interest for a lawyer. To place the question squarely, does the commandment that we forgive all men mean that litigation and lawsuits are inherently wrong? I believe the answer to this question is no, but it's an important question that every lawyer must ask herself and that every client should also confront. Indeed, it's often a question with which those who have been grievously harmed must wrestle. One of the best explorations of this issue is contained in a book by Elder Dallin H. Oaks entitled The Lord's Way. Elder Oaks begins by rejecting um, what he describes as two extreme views. First, that a Christian should never use courts to resolve disputes. And second, that there are no religious restraints on participating in litigation. Now, as an aside, isn't it interesting how such tough questions often cannot be reduced to easy, all-or-nothing answers? I hope it's not just the lawyer in me, um, but I've always found it simultaneously comforting and stressful that the restored gospel frequently requires us to wrestle with understanding principles in apparent tension. Thus, both faith and works are necessary for salvation. Both faith and reason are the work of this university. Both the body and the spirit constitute the soul of man. Both personal inspiration and priesthood authority are important to understanding God's will. Whereas the world often suggests the answer must be either or, the restored gospel finds a way to say both and. It seems that a core principle of the restored gospel is that we must learn by our experience to understand, obey, and navigate eternal truths that may appear to be in some tension. Perhaps more accurately, we are expected to embrace, embrace both sides of such apparently opposing principles. Although one might be able to categorize some lawsuits as clearly inbounds or out of bounds, Elder Oaks, unsurprisingly, largely eschews categorization and instead focuses on principles or preconditions that should govern whether to file a lawsuit. For example, he emphasizes that we must begin by forgiving our adversary and removing revenge as a motive. We should then pursue settlement as a manifestation of the principle articulated by the Savior in Matthew that if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother." Close quote. Elder Oaks also identifies a third precondition, that a litigant should consider the impact a lawsuit will have on others. Again, this is simply a manifestation of the Savior's teaching of the Golden Rule. 
All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Today, today let me suggest one additional set of criteria by which the conduct of a lawyer should be judged. Those criteria come from section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants and its teachings on exercising power in the priesthood. Now I recognize uh, that a license to practice law is quite different than the priesthood of God. Um, passing the bar doesn't give someone the authority to act in God's name, although critics may occasionally wonder if that's what lawyers believe. Still, if one stops and thinks about it, a legal education and a license to practice law are instruments of power. The power flows not just or even primarily from the state's exclusive license to give legal advice, but also from the refined critical and analytical thinking skills and from problem solving skills that cause others to look to lawyers for help with their most vexing problems. If as lawyers we have the power, the question is how we should use it. Or um, for non-lawyers, how you should expect your lawyer to use his or her power. In that regard, let me paraphrase a few familiar verses from section, 21, section 121. The power of a lawyer cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. That a license to practice may be conferred upon us, it is true. But when we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride, our vain ambition, or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, amen to the authority of that lawyer. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of a lawyer's status, only by persuasion, long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. Now, much more could be said on this topic, but today I simply want to emphasize that if lawyers use their power and authority consistent with the principles of Section 121, and if clients who may have been victimized likewise adhere to these eternal yet challenging standards, litigation need not stand in opposition to the principle of forgiveness. As I finish, let me return to the heart of my message, which is the Savior's promise in Matthew that he will forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. These are two sides of the same coin. We can't have faith in only one side of the atonement. To be efficacious, to have saving power, our faith in Christ and His atonement must include both His power to pay for our sins and His power to pay for the sins of others. Harking back to my landlord-tenant analogy, sometimes we burn the house down through our own carelessness. We play with fire. Sometimes the house burns down through no fault of our own. Lightning strikes, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Sometimes our house burns down because of the sins of others, the landlord's arson of son, in my analogy. The wonder of the atonement is that it works for all three. But our own receipt of the atonement is conditional on forgiving others. If we do that, accept Christ, and strive to keep his commandments, we will receive the castle and all, the, all else the Father has. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with James Rasband was given on October 23, 2012.